This is London. Hours, Greenwich Mean Time, BBC World Service, the news read by David Austin. The man who lost more than two and a half billion dollars on the world's copper markets has gone on trial in Japan. Nawaz Sharif, the leader of the Muslim League in Pakistan, has been sworn in as the country's new Prime Minister. And a campaign by a group of French artists and intellectuals against tougher immigration laws has been denounced by the Prime Minister. One of the world's biggest fraud trials has begun in Tokyo, involving the loss of more than two and a half billion dollars by a Japanese dealer in copper, Yasuo Hamanaka. He admits that over ten years he forged the signatures of his superiors and invented fictitious deals to conceal disastrous losses. Hamanaka was speculating in copper for the Sumitomo Corporation, which says he carried out his deception alone and without approval from his superiors. But the prosecution described the wealthy style in which Mr. Hamanaka lived, of foreign travel and extravagant spending, and said he used his frauds to pretend that Sumitomo's copper dealing was invariably successful. Experts question whether such huge losses could have been concealed so long from Sumitomo executives, but correspondents say that doubt is unlikely to be answered at the trial. Pakistan's new Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif, of the Muslim League, has been sworn in, pledging to revitalize the economy and change the destiny of the country. He told the National Assembly he was aware of his responsibility to get the country out of its political and economic crisis, and also said major steps were needed to restore confidence in a police force, which he said suffered from rampant corruption and coercion at all levels. He repeated the long-standing accusations by Pakistan of atrocities by Indian troops in Kashmir and called again for a plebiscite conducted by the United Nations on the independence of the divided territory. The American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, continuing her first foreign trip since taking office, has been having talks in Bonn with Chancellor Kohl and the German Foreign Minister, Klaus Kinkel. The eastward expansion of NATO was expected to be the main topic. The BBC State Department correspondent says President Clinton sees Chancellor Kohl as his most important partner in trying to persuade Moscow that NATO's expansion is not a threat to Russia. Our correspondent says that Germany generally favours greater Russian integration with NATO than the United States does. But he says the differences between Washington and Bonn's positions are mainly tactical rather than substantive. The French Prime Minister, Alain Juppé, has denounced a campaign of civil disobedience by artists and intellectuals against government proposals to tighten up immigration laws. Mr. Juppé said the campaign undermined the state and democracy. The artists have signed a petition vowing to flout the new law if it's introduced. They object in particular to a clause in the immigration bill requiring any French citizen acting as host to a foreign visitor with a visa to notify the authorities when the visitor leaves the country. The artists say the bill is an attempt to neutralize the appeal of the racist extreme right wing. The government says it's simply designed to reduce the number of people living in France without proper papers, estimated at about a million. A row is developing in Israel over reports that the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, may delay the building of a controversial Jewish settlement in mainly Arab East Jerusalem. Israeli newspapers quoted sources near to the Prime Minister as saying he told President Clinton last week that to avoid disrupting peace talks with the Palestinians, the project at Har Homa could be put off. Mr. Netanyahu's aides say no such promise was given and that a decision has yet to be made. But the mayor of Jerusalem, Ayud Olmert, who is a right-wing deputy in the governing Likud bloc, has publicly warned that he will send bulldozers to Har Homa to start clearing it if it's confirmed that the project has been suspended. Rebels in Tajikistan have released the security minister, Sadamir Zukharov, who's been held hostage along with five others in the east of the country.
The rebels have freed Mr. Zukharov after several hours of direct talks in the town of Obigarum with President Imomali Rachmanov. A BBC correspondent in Dushanbe says it's not clear yet whether any deal has been struck and what's happened to the remaining five hostages. Earlier, the Interfax news agency said they'd arrived in Obigarum shortly after the talks began. And that's the end of the news. World Business Report from the BBC World Service. This is Rodney Smith in London. First, the main business. That's after a bulletin of the latest world news and at 15.05, sporting action and results in Sports Roundup. This is London. Hours, Greenwich Mean Time, BBC World Service, the news read by Roger Harvey. The British Foreign Secretary has challenged Germany to declare how far it wants to go towards European integration. He said tens of millions of people shared Britain's concern about the increasing centralization of power. President Mandela has agreed to host a meeting between the Zairean government and leaders of the rebel forces which control much of the east of the country. Prosecutors in South Korea have charged high-ranking officials in connection with the collapse of the Hanbo Steel Company. The opposition says they're scapegoats. The British Foreign Secretary, Malcolm Rifkind, has made an outspoken attack on German plans to give more power to the European Union, suggesting that they could lead to a European superstate. In a speech in Bonn, Mr. Rifkind challenged the German government to say how far it wanted to go towards integration. He said there was a grave risk in taking power away from established national institutions and giving it to new, less legitimate European bodies. Mr. Rifkin said the European Union couldn't afford to brush aside the deeply held concerns of tens of millions of people throughout the European Union. The European Parliament has condemned both Britain and the European Commission for the way they've handled the crisis over mad cow disease among British cattle. The Parliament voted overwhelmingly to endorse an inquiry report on the crisis, which led to the collapse of the beef market last year. The report accused Britain of irresponsibility in allowing suspect cattle feed to be exported after it had been banned. It also threatened the Commission with dismissal later this year unless it improved its system of dealing with public health issues. President Mandela of South Africa says representatives of the Zairean government and rebel forces are to meet in South Africa this week to try to end the escalating conflict in their country. President Mandela said the two sides had asked him to host the meeting and he'd agreed to do so. He said he hoped the talks would take place on Thursday. A plane was being sent to Rwanda to pick up Zaire's rebel leader, Laurent Kabila. Earlier, both sides criticized a United Nations peace plan aimed at ending the fighting, which proposed an immediate ceasefire followed by elections. Prosecutors in South Korea have brought corruption charges against 10 senior politicians and businessmen in connection with the collapse of the giant Hanbo Steel Corporation. Three close aides to President Kim Young-san and several leading bankers are among those accused of taking bribes in return for arranging massive loans for the company. Nine of the accused are already in custody. The BBC correspondent in Seoul says critics of the government believe they are scapegoats and that the charges are part of a political smokescreen to protect the president himself. Gunmen have killed at least six people in attacks during the night in the Tajikistan capital, Dushanbe. 
Police said the murders were all committed by the same group. The victims included a Russian officer serving with border troops and two uniformed Tajik guards from the United States Embassy. The crew of the American Space Shuttle Discovery have released the Hubble Space Telescope after carrying out a number of modifications to enable it to look deeper into space. The shuttle's mechanical arm raised Hubble from the cargo bay where astronauts had spent the last few days upgrading its instruments and repairing damage caused by the sun's heat. Hubble has now been returned to orbit and should be able to examine even more distant stars and galaxies than before. The American Secretary of State Madeleine Albright is in London on the latest stage of a tour during which she's been addressing Russia's fears about NATO's expansion plans. She's due to meet the Prime Minister John Major and the Foreign Secretary Malcolm Rifkind. Reports from Moscow say that President Yeltsin has told the visiting German Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel in a telephone conversation that Russia wants a legally binding treaty with NATO if the alliance expands. And that's the end of this Bulletin of World News from London. BBC. A Bulletin of World News is next here in the BBC World Service. Then in five minutes, our sports team emerge from the players' tunnel with the latest sports roundup. This is London. Fifteen hours, Greenwich Mean Time. BBC World Service. The news read by Michael McLean. The Chinese authorities have announced that the funeral of Deng Xiaoping will take place on Tuesday. But in line with traditional practice, foreign dignitaries will not be invited. Appeals have gone out to the Chinese people to support Mr. Deng's chosen successor, President Jiang Zemin. The other main stories? Gunmen in Pakistan have shot dead seven people at an Iranian cultural center in Punjab province. The American Secretary of State is in Moscow on a mission to ease Russian concerns over the expansion of NATO. The funeral ceremony for China's paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, is to be held next Tuesday in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. In a statement, his family said it would demonstrate its grief in a simple and dignified way. In a departure from tradition, there'll be no period of lying in state. After his remains are cremated, Deng's ashes will be placed in the Great Hall, where some 10,000 people representing the Communist Party, the army and the public are expected to pay their respects. Factory, ship and train sirens will sound for three minutes across the whole of China. In line with normal Chinese practice, foreign leaders are not being invited. Official broadcasts called Deng a man of vision and determination and praised him as an architect of reforms which have given China one of the fastest growing economies in the world. A member of the old guard of Chinese leaders, Deng Xiaoping was purged during the ultra-left cultural revolution of the late 1960s, but emerged as paramount leader in 1978, two years after the death of Chairman Mao Zedong. The BBC Beijing correspondent says there's some sadness among the Chinese public and concern about the nation's political stability. But life in the capital has continued as normal. Official announcements have appealed to people to unite under Mr. Deng's chosen successor, President Jiang Zemin, who's Communist Party's Secretary General and head of the Central Military Commission. But correspondents say Mr. Jiang may lack the personality and power base to retain his position in the event of a leadership struggle. President Yeltsin has sent a telegram to the Chinese leadership expressing his condolences for the death of Deng Xiaoping. He described Mr. Deng as an outstanding statesman and politician and praised him for helping to create a trusting partnership between the two nations. The Russian parliament observed a minute's silence. The North Korean leader, Kim Jong-il, called Mr. Deng an intimate friend and comrade in arms of the Korean people. 
Share prices in China, Taiwan and Hong Kong dipped briefly on news of Mr. Deng's death, but all recovered to close higher on the day's trading. Armed men have attacked an Iranian cultural center in Pakistan, killing seven people. The unidentified gunmen forced their way into the center of the city in Multan in Punjab province and opened fire with automatic weapons. The Iranian head of the center, Mohammed Ali Rahimi, and six Pakistanis, most of them employed at the center, were killed. The attack follows a similar one a month ago on the Iranian cultural center in Lahore. Iran has accused a Sunni Muslim extremist group, Sipai Sahaba, of being responsible. The Iranian ambassador has protested to the Pakistani government. Pakistani officials say a high-level inquiry has been ordered. The American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, has arrived in Moscow to discuss Russia's concerns about the proposed expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe. She's due to hold talks with the Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin and Foreign Minister Evgeny Primakov before a scheduled meeting on Friday with President Yeltsin. She'll be the first senior American official to meet the Russian leader since he became seriously ill last year. Mrs. Albright has proposed a package of measures to ease Russia's fears about the proposed NATO expansion. As well as plans to create a joint Russian-NATO peacekeeping force, she says that NATO will offer to reduce its conventional military forces in Europe. A government, the government of South Africa has begun a series of meetings aimed at bringing the two sides in the Zairean conflict together. A spokesman for President Mandela confirmed that discussions had begun but gave no further details. Reports say that an envoy of the Zairean rebel leader Nora Kabila and a Zairean government official are already in Cape Town. But the Zairean government has denied involvement, saying it will continue its fight against the rebels who've seized a number of towns on Zaire's eastern border. And that's the end of the news. BBC World Service, this is Gordon Farker with Sports Roundup. <laughs> Hello, in this edition, the Williams Motor Racing Team goes on trial in Italy over Ayrton Senna's death. Anderlecht Football Club call in the police over blackmail problems, and the pole vault world record is bettered again in Australia. The trial in Italy of three members of the Williams Motor Racing Team and three officials charged with the manslaughter of Ayrton Senna has been adjourned at Imola. It will reopen on February the 28th. The three times world champion died when he crashed his Williams at the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix almost three years ago. All six defendants deny the charges. Joe Parsons reports. The world's media poured into the small town of Imola for the first trial of its kind in Europe. More than 75 camera crews, photographers and journalists jostled for space in the packed temporary courtroom. So tiny is the regular court that proceedings were moved to a converted social club hall. In future, media presence will be restricted to just two television cameras and defendants won't be filmed against their wishes. The first session was taken up with preliminary legal matters and the trial will reopen on February the 28th. Only one of the six facing charges, the race organiser Federico Bendinelli, appeared for the first day. Frank Williams, Patrick Head and Adrian Newey of the Williams team are likely to make their first appearance at court on April the 28th. Ironically, the day after this year... Hours Greenwich Mean Time, BBC World Service, the news, read by Vivian Stewart. The armed forces in China have pledged their loyalty to the country's new leadership following the death of Deng Xiaoping. The South Korean Foreign Minister has warned that the situation in North Korea is worryingly volatile. The Zairean rebel leader says he's suspending attacks on government forces while talks continue to try to end the conflict. The Chinese army has declared its loyalty to the country's new leadership, headed by President Jiang Zemin, following the death of the paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping. The three main branches of the military promised to carry on Mr. Deng's reforms and to maintain stability and unity in the armed forces. The BBC Beijing correspondent says that unquestioning military support will be crucial to President Jiang 
if he is to consolidate his authority over the coming months. Although he has not served in the army, he's used his position as chairman of the Communist Party's military commission to put his own allies into key military positions. The South Korean Foreign Minister, Yu Chong Ha, has described the situation in North Korea as volatile and very fluid. He said the priority must be to avoid armed conflict in the Korean Peninsula. Mr. Yu was speaking in Seoul after talks with the visiting American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Mrs. Albright welcomed the announcement by the North Korean Foreign Ministry on Friday that it would attend a preliminary meeting with United States and South Korean officials in New York next month to discuss a possible peace conference. It would be the first meeting between the two Korean governments for nearly three years. The BBC Seoul correspondent says Mrs. Albright's visit comes at a time of growing concern about the stability of the North Korean government. Mrs. Albright's talks in South Korea coincided with the announcement by North Korea that a senior figure in its leadership, the Defense Minister, Marshal Che Gwang, had died of a heart attack. Marshal Che, who was 78, was a key member of North Korea's first generation of communist revolutionary leaders. Yesterday, the North Koreans disclosed that the Prime Minister, Kang Song Sing, had been replaced through illness, while a third top official, Hwang Jang Yop, is reported to be seeking asylum in South Korea. The President of Tajikistan, Emali Rachmanov, and the exiled opposition leader, Saeed Abdullah Nuri, have agreed to share power to try to end a five-year-old civil war that has cost the lives of about 50,000 people. They signed an agreement at Mashhad in Iran under which they will set up a joint commission for national reconciliation which will pave the way for elections. Mr. Nuri will preside over the committee and he is due to return to Tajikistan from exile next month after the next round of talks between the two sides which will concentrate on military cooperation between the army and rebel forces. The Zairean rebel leader, Laurent Kabila, says his forces have suspended a planned military offensive as a goodwill gesture while negotiations continue to try to end the conflict in eastern Zaire. Speaking in the rebel-held town of Bukavu, Mr. Kabir said the rebels would resume fighting if there were no progress during the talks in South Africa. Yesterday, Mr. Kabir said he was prepared to join the negotiations, but only with a senior government official. And he insisted on nothing less than the removal from power of President Mobutu. The BBC correspondent in East Africa says Mr. Mobutu has returned to his French home at a time when his presence in Zaire could have helped clarify confusion in the government ranks. Politicians in Britain have strongly criticised a German newspaper for highlighting the Jewish background of the British Foreign Secretary Malcolm Rifkind in reporting a speech he made in Bonn. The paper, the Frankfurter Allgemeine, said it was ironic that being a Jew, Mr Rifkind should have ended his speech by quoting the German Protestant reformer Martin Luther. One British politician said the wording was reminiscent of the way in which fascists referred to Jewish people. The writer of the article himself has not commented on the report. And that's the end of the news. BBC World Service. This is the World Business Review. Hello, South Africa's in the Philippines at the start of a tour of Southeast Asia. He was welcomed by President Fidel Ramos, who described Mr. Mandela as one of the towering figures of the 20th century for leading South Africa out of apartheid. Mr. Mandela is accompanied by a 50-strong delegation of business leaders, and officials signed agreements on trade. The South African leaders accompanied for the first time on a foreign trip by Grassa Michelle, the 51-year-old widow of the former president of Mozambique. You're listening to Newsdesk in the BBC World Service. A marathon meeting of Turkey's National Security Council has brought to a head the long-running tensions between the Islamist Prime Minister Necmettin Erbakan and senior military commanders. At the meeting, chaired by the Turkish President Suleyman Demirel, Mr. Erbakan had to face criticism for his attempts at Islamic reforms. 
a council dominated by the country's secularist establishment. Our Ankara correspondent Chris Nuttall reports that the army's growing opposition to Turkey's Islamist-led government has led to fears of a possible military coup. This predicted grilling of the Prime Minister by the powerful military began in mid-afternoon and ended at midnight, the meeting taking three times its normal length. A statement afterwards said there would be no concessions on Turkey's secular tradition, which it said was a guarantee of social stability. The Chief of General Staff and the commanders of the Army, Navy and Air Force had piled up thick dossiers on the conference table beforehand of intelligence gathered about Islamic radicalism. The Navy chief said earlier this week that the armed forces viewed Islamic fundamentalism as a bigger threat now than the PKK Kurdish separatist guerrillas they've been fighting in the southeast since the 1980s. Of particular concern has been a huge rise in the number of guns sold in strongholds of Mr Erbakan's welfare party. The military is also reported to be worried about welfare's links with Islamic groups abroad, how it has been embedding its supporters in the state bureaucracy, and how Islamic groups are gaining control of some parts of industry. Dozens of tanks were sent through an Ankara suburb on February the 4th after the local welfare mayor held a Muslim festival with fundamentalist overtones. This has provoked speculation about a possible fourth military coup since 1960. But the military can act short of this and make recommendations for the government to change its ways through the National Security Council, including dropping proposed reforms seen as against the secular constitution, such as the lifting of a ban on women wearing Muslim headscarves in government offices. Chris Nuttall in Ankara. Turkey says Iran has demanded the withdrawal of its ambassador from Tehran and a consul general in a tit-for-tat diplomatic row. The Iranian ambassador in Ankara was expelled last month after having reportedly made a speech calling for the introduction of Sharia law in Turkey. The Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat is in Cairo seeking support against Israel's planned expansion of Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem. Mr. Arafat will be meeting the Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak, and addressing an emergency session of the Arab League. Barbara Plett in Cairo sent us this report. Yasser Arafat regularly consults President Mubarak about developments and setbacks in the peace process. So it's not surprising that he would want to meet the Egyptian leader just before a trip to Washington. The talks are expected to focus on Israeli plans to build Jewish homes in Arab East Jerusalem, widely condemned in the Arab world as an attempt to strengthen Israel's position before the start of talks on the final status of the disputed city. Mr. Arafat is also expected to address an extraordinary session of the Arab League Council, called to draw up a united Arab status on the issue. The Secretary General of the Arab League has already condemned Israel's decision as a flagrant breach of UN resolutions and a danger to the peace process. President Mubarak has also warned that the housing plan could lead to an outbreak of violence between Palestinians and Israelis, but so far he has restrained his normally outspoken criticisms of Israel. Mr. Arafat's response has also been muted, ensuring that Palestinian protest demonstrations remained peaceful. Observers say both Arab leaders seem eager to avoid open confrontation with Israel ahead of high-level meetings with the main sponsor of the peace process. President Mubarak will be traveling to Washington a week after Mr. Arafat. He's also expected expected to host Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the coming days. Barbara Platt in Cairo. The United Nations says first deliveries of relief aid should start arriving in Iraq today, following a deal agreed last November, allowing Iraq to sell $2 billion worth of oil for humanitarian purposes. The World Health Organization has described conditions in the Iraqi Health Service as desperate. One official of the organization, Kiyotaka Akasaka, has just returned from Iraq. We saw four hospitals and clinics and two warehouses of medicine. The state of health in those health facilities was, uh, was really terrible. The medicine was uh, lacking, children were malnourished, and the doctors and nurses were without medicine and medical equipment. He also warned of the likelihood of further health problems when the malaria season begins. The season of malaria is approaching and in April they have got, particularly in the north, 
they have got to start spraying the insecticide. They are in need of uh, insecticide, otherwise malaria will be quite serious. And diphtheria and also diarrhea uh, for children because, you know, the water environment is terrible. Kiyotaka Akosaka of the World Health Organization. Still to come in news desk, one of the bloodiest gun battles in Los Angeles in recent years is shown live on American television. But now look again at our top story. The Albanian parliament has called an emergency session to discuss the situation in the southern city of Laura, where at least four people were killed and more than 20 injured in violent clashes on Friday. The violence started after the secret police tried to break into a university building where students are staging a hunger strike to demand the resignation of the government over the collapse of investment schemes. The president of Colombia, Ernesto Samper, has bitterly attacked a decision by the United States not to accept his country as an ally in the international fight against drugs. President Clinton decided to decertify Colombia for the second year running on the grounds that it was not doing enough to tackle the illegal drugs trade. President Samper described the decision as unjust, repugnant and discriminatory. In the U.S. Congress, there was broad support for President Clinton's decision. A Republican congressman, Donald Manzula, said the government in Bogota had only itself to blame. The problem is that it is within the Colombian government itself that the United States does not recognize any really good faith effort uh, to get rid of drugs down there, regardless of what happened to those cartels. There is a world of difference to the United States between Colombia and Mexico. Colombia's ambassador to Britain, Carlos Limons, described the decision as politically motivated. He rejected the American accusation that Colombia hadn't done enough to fight drugs. That is not true. We have all the Cali cartel in jail. We have destroyed the whole of the Medellin cartel. We have uh, uh, fumigated thousands and thousands of acres of uh, coca plantations and opium poppy plantations. We have seized many laboratories. We had a law that uh, allows the Colombian authorities to seize the assets of the drug dealers, so uh, more cannot be expected. Carlos Limons of Colombia. Five other countries also remain on the United States drugs blacklist and face sanctions. Afghanistan, Burma, Iran, Nigeria and Syria. Three more states, Pakistan, Lebanon and Belize, are on the list but escape sanctions. Police in Los Angeles have been hunting for a suspected bank robber who escaped after a gun battle which went on for several hours and which was broadcast live on the city's television networks. Two of the robbers were shot dead and at least 13 people were wounded. From Los Angeles, Clive Myrie reports. An area up to a mile square had been cordoned off by police in North Hollywood as the hunt progressed for at least one other bank robber. But the search is now being scaled down for the suspect, thought to be part of a gang that tried to rob a branch of the Bank of America at around 9.30 in the morning local time. But the robbery ended in failure and a bloody shootout, captured live on television. Millions of viewers watched as the robbers, wearing full body armor, fired hundreds of rounds of ammunition at police officers in a gun battle that lasted half an hour. Two of the robbers were killed, while ten police officers and three bystanders were injured. A third suspect is thought to have escaped. Los Angeles has been described as the bank robbery capital of the world, with four to five taking place every day, but none as bloody as this one. Clive Myrie reporting there from California. You're listening to News Desk in the BBC World Service and it's now 10.21 Greenwich Mean Time. Rescue efforts are underway to help the survivors of earthquakes in Iran and Pakistan. The leader of the Taliban movement in Afghanistan gives a rare media interview. As southern Albania slips further out of government control, it's emerged that local military units and police helped rebels seize the town of Jerokasta and fight off attempts by government forces to retake it. The rebels have seized tanks and deployed them outside Jerokasta, which is on the main route south to Greece. The deadline in an amnesty offered by President Berisha has expired, with no move by the rebels to surrender. They say they will make no concessions until President Berisha resigns. 
Our correspondent, Paul Wood, is in Jerocaster. A short time ago, he sent this report. Albanian men in Jiracasta proudly fire off their new automatic weapons, just acquired from the former army barracks in the town. The looting of weapons is still going on, with every available form of transport pressed into service. Trucks, ambulances, even mules. Guns, ammunition and even anti-tank weapons lie strewn across the ground, and children as young as 10 can be seen carrying automatic rifles. Local people say that no one is in charge. It's a free-for-all although everyone is united by a hatred of the government and fear of what might happen if the government comes in to retake the town. The weapons are now seen as essential for their self-defence. Down with Sally Berisha, this man says, as he brandishes his looted Kalashnikov rifle. Everyone in Jiracasta and in the other southern towns in revolt say their minimum demand is for President Berisha to resign. The Albanian leader has offered new elections after the rebels have surrendered their weapons. But people here will only give up their guns to a caretaker government, if at all. And there seems as yet no way to end this crisis without bloodshed. And there have been similar scenes in the southern port of Flora as the rebels extend their control. Our correspondent Peter Morgan is there. In Vlora, central fortress of Albania's rebel south, the crowds are in no mood for compromise. Military leaders have been elected to defend the city if crisis turns to war. Rebel demands include the immediate resignation of President Sali Berisha and 100% repayment of funds lost in corrupt government-backed investment schemes. Food is short in Vlora, bread is about the only sustenance available and people are clamouring for that. However, hunger does not seem to have diminished the rebels' resolve. It's the same story across the south. In Saranda, demonstrators demand Berisha must go. Three townsmen injured in skirmishes with government forces have been treated in hospital there, but there's been no serious engagement between government and rebel troops. The insurgents are certainly not short of armour. Tanks have been seized from an army which chose not to resist. Gunboats have been commandeered and now patrol the coast, guarding against a seaborne assault. Peter Morgan in Florida, and before that we heard from Paul Wood in Jerocaster. Demonstrators are expected to return in force to the streets of the Serbian capital Belgrade today to demand reform of the state-run media and improve conditions for forthcoming parliamentary and presidential elections. The march is intended to mark the anniversary of a similar demonstration six years ago when two people died in clashes with the police. But it will also be the first big opposition gathering since President Milosevic gave in to the opposition's demands last month for recognition of its victories in local elections. From Belgrade, Karen Coleman reports. Tens of thousands are expected to turn out in what will be the first opposition-led march in Belgrade after three months of consistent demonstrations finished. That was after Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic caved into demand to recognize opposition wins from municipal elections in Belgrade and other Serbian cities and towns. But the protesters are still not happy. They are calling for greater reforms of the state-run media and fairer conditions for forthcoming parliamentary and presidential elections. The marches are being held primarily because they come on the sixth anniversary of demonstrations held in the city back in March 1991. Then there were battles with the police. Two people